Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again, to Messiah and Messiah alone, be all the praise, honor, and glory. And today is the 18th day, right, Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 18th day of the fifth month of the year 2019. Today, I'm here to help our 10-year-old daughter, Anna. She turned 10 on the 13th day, dear brothers and sisters. So yes, she's now 10. So I'm here to help her once again. Anna is here to share, I believe, three urgent visions and two very urgent words which Messiah wants us, wants her to share once again. And between the words and visions, Messiah telling us about his imminent return and for us to be ready, I believe, seven times, seven times between the words and visions. Today, Messiah is warning us once again that we be ye ready. His return is imminent. The time is upon us, dear brothers and sisters. Rapture is going to be like any other day, as the Bible tells us. It's going to be any other day. We won't know, we won't understand the shofar of God, the trump of God will sound. And then God, Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah himself will descend in the clouds and call his bride, come up hither. And that will be the moment and that is exactly the moment we are waiting upon, dear brothers and sisters. While we are waiting, the longer we wait, the more the enemy is using all kinds of weapons, all kinds of tools to confuse us, to make us weary, dear brothers and sisters. Indeed, we are almost at the finish line. Titus 2.13 tells us that this is our blessed hope, rapture of the bride, rapture of the church, of Lord Jesus Christ is our blessed hope. But Satan is working over time to make it our Weary hope, a tired hope, but that's not what it is. That's what the enemy is trying to portray, dear brothers and sisters. Deceptions and heresies are all around. Wheat and tares, we understand from the parable of Matthew and all over, all across the scriptures, deceptions and heresy will be the biggest end time markers. The scriptures tell us that that should not discourage us, that should lead us once again to know God's plan of redemption through his word that rapture is indeed imminent dear brothers and sisters if you are weary and tired once again please 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 don't hesitate dear brothers and sisters if you have any prayer requests we will leave our contact in the description box below please please don't hesitate once again to for you sending us your prayer request dear brothers and sisters let us keep praying for each other because prayer is being the seventh piece as Ephesians 6.18 tells us that being the seventh piece of a spiritual armor, it is a heavy artillery weapon which works at a distance. And we also wanted to mention to all our dear fellow brethren, all our dear brothers and sisters, our spiritual family, once again, that we are indeed praying for each and every single of our dear fellow brethren who have asked for prayers once again, so that Messiah's mighty will be accomplished, so that Messiah strengthens and empowers you with his empowering grace in these end moments, so that his mighty will be accomplished, so that he once again can direct your paths, guide your steps, so that his purpose be accomplished accomplished through you and in you dear brothers and sisters we are indeed at the finish line but we can indeed that is exactly why that is exactly why we can feel once again the attacks increasing attacks the the encroaching darkness and we feel weary perhaps waiting upon rapture but dear brothers and sisters the most important thing what will matter what will matter in these last of the last of the last moment is who or what is our anchor. Based on that and that alone we can finish this race strong because it is indeed time once again dear brothers and sisters to understand that we need to finish this race strong and Satan doesn't want us to but who or what is our anchor. Who or what is our anchor once again will determine in the days that remain, it will determine whether we will be able to finish this race strong or not, dear brothers and sisters. The truth is, signs and wonders come and go. Speculations fail. Conjectures don't work the way it is said. Astronomic, astronomical events come and go, leaving us wanting for more. 
and more and more. Churches are inconsistent. Best friends change. People change. But there is one. There is one, dear brothers and sisters, who never changes. Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yes, he never changes. Why? Because the inerrant and infallible word of God tells us in Hebrews 13, 8, what Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. Dear brothers and sisters, humans are weak and sinful. Religion is weak and failing. But Christ, there is none like him. There is no one like Christ. He is the King of Kings and he is the Lord of Lords. He is the Son of God and He is the infinite perfection. He is strong, He is mighty and He has never ever failed. He has fulfilled every promise He has ever made because all His promises are yes in Him and amen in Him and there is none like Him. He and He alone is the Savior of the world, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The question is, dear brothers and sisters, Then what do we do when the storms of life come? When we get disappointed, when we give into our own flesh and get disappointed, what do we do? To whom do we turn? Where do we seek comfort and security during such tumultuous times? During such dangerous times? During such deceptive times? Today, an honest answer, an honest answer to that, dear brothers and sisters, An honest answer to that question can really change the entire outcome of the days that remain in our lives in these end of the end moments. Because throughout our lives, dear brothers and sisters, storms come and go unexpectedly. But they do not have to throw us off balance. Scripture assures every true born again believer that we can be steady regardless of our circumstances and situations. Our circumstances, our situations, our relationships, they don't define, they don't and they should not be defining us. Only Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth should. Today is the day to pronounce yea, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but we will fear no evil. There is an amazing truth. In the Bible, dear brothers and sisters, that will keep each one of us steady during the most difficult, most trying times in our deepest valleys. And our anchor, our anchor for the storms of life is Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Lord Jesus Christ is the one who never changes. Why is this so vital today, dear brothers and sisters? It it might seem like a very simple point, very very simple point because yes, I know yeah, Christ is my savior, but when the storms come, when the disappointments are hitting us, when Satan is deceiving us, this becomes so vital. Why? Because Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ is the anchor which does not change. And what do we mean by an anchor once again? Let, let, let us consider that every single thing in our lives, Dear brothers and sisters, every single thing, whether it be the career, relationships, our circumstances, our situations, it is always in a state of constant change, right? As a matter of fact, we ourselves, we ourselves are aging and changing every minute of each day. And there is nothing we can do, you and me can do to stop this process. In fact, even the current heaven and earth will grow old and perish. And like a garment, there will be change. Revelation 21 tells us that. Yet, through it all, Lord Jesus Christ, there is one who remains the same and he will. He is with us and will be with us forever and ever and ever. Dear brothers and sisters, if we try to hold tightly to any of the earthly things, whether it be relationships, whether it be materialistic position or what, whatsoever it be, during our hardships, during our trials and valleys, if we look to our earthly solutions and answers through earthly relationship and earthly, earthly materialistic things, we will be tossed about in various directions. Why? Because since we have affixed ourselves to an unstable foundation that's continually shifting. However, if we place our hope in the living Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
You and me can be sure that the anchor will hold because he isn't moving. He isn't changing. He isn't leaving. Lord Jesus Christ and his Lord are the two, are the two things that will never ever change. But everything else does and will. It always did. Everything else always did and it always will. And yes, that includes our own thoughts and our own feelings, dear brothers and sisters. Today is Anna Shea's Messiah's visions and words. Today Anna has a message, as a matter of fact, for us once again, solely guided by the Spirit of God, talking about the times we are living in, how the enemy is trying to once again push us into that hopelessness, that despair, the basically she'll be talking once again about the modus operandi of the enemy, which is so crucial to understand. So today as Anna shares the visions and words from Messiah and the message, let us not once again understand by our feelings, for we walk by faith and not feelings. Feelings change. So today is the day, so let us bow our hearts and ask Lord Jesus Christ to decrease all our external inputs so that at this time we can be plugged into Messiah's frequency and the Spirit of God can teach us and Messiah can accomplish his mighty purpose through us and in us during this time. And let's bow our hearts and let's start with a word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 We just praise you, Father. We just thank you, Lord, for one more glorious day, one more glorious message, one more glorious reminder, Lord. That you are the anchor which will never change. And our Messiah is coming and coming indeed to get his bride, to get his own whom he redeemed. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible extremes you went on our behalf to redeem, to redeem filthy people, puny men to specks of dust like us. We thank you, Father, that by your grace and your grace alone, God's riches at Christ's expense, that you have called each one of us. And not by any merit of our own. We thank you, Father, that you have allowed your only begotten Son, Yeshua HaMashiach, to purchase our liberty from the law, to purchase our redemption, our access to you. Father, today we also thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, the indwelling Holy Spirit for every true born again believer which you have sent us so that the Holy Spirit can keep every true born again believer holy, which is to separate us for your purposes so that the Holy Spirit can teach us, can comfort us and can lead us to the absolute truth. Father, oftentimes we don't understand your ways Many times we don't understand because your ways are higher and your thoughts are higher because you are situated higher, Father, today. We bring all our dear fellow brethren, every single dear brothers and sisters in your presence. Help us, Lord, today once again to trust you, to overcome our unbelief, to trust you that you can be trusted at all times, that you are the one who have created us. You are the one who have orchestrated this tapestry of redemption, this plan of redemption, and you are the one who has the perfect plan and the perfect timing for rapture help us Lord today help every single of our dear fellow brethren with as we struggle with bearing the fruit of the spirit help us Lord help us Lord once again may your power once again be manifested in our lives. Help us, Lord, to show the holy love of God, to show the holy joy, the holy peace, the holy patience, the holy kindness, the holy goodness, the holy faithfulness, the holy gentleness, and the holy self-control for each one of us, which is only possible when we walk in the Spirit. Father, we surrender every single of our dear fellow brethren unto thy mighty hands today, Lord, and pray, Lord, once again, if you would please increase in each one of us and every single of our dear fellow brethren a new appetite. Lord, a renewed hunger for thee and thy, thy word, that we each might grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, but also... Father, we each might be more discerning, more perspective to what you precisely have, Lord, for each one of us in the days that remain. Father, as we behold the horizon today once again and sense the urgency of the perilous times we are living in, Lord, we do seek discernment, Father, once again, that we might know what it is you would have each one of us do, Lord. Father, once again, we do understand that the opportunity is not mandated that you have called each one of us, every single of our dear fellow brethren to us, 
specific task. Oh, Father, today we pray that we pray. Oh, Holy Father, that if you would through your Holy Spirit, Lord, please make that evidently clear to each one of us, to every single of our dear fellow brethren, Lord, that in the days that remain, we might be each more fruitful and faithful stewards of the opportunities, Lord, you are presenting us with. Father, once again, today I bring Anna. And myself in your presence, Lord, and pray, Lord, as we convey your message to your appointed people, Lord, today, please be our strength and our weaknesses. We anoint every word, every alphabet which comes out of our mouth, Lord, whatever is not from you, please let it not happen through me, through men, or through us. It is impossible. Matthew 19, 26 tells us that through you, Lord, everything is possible. Today, we claim on Psalm 141, verse 3, and pray, Father, once again, that please, please do set a guard over our mouths and keep watch, Lord, over the door of our lips as we convey your message, Lord, to your appointed people. And once again, at this moment, in the name of our coming and reigning King, Yeshua HaMashiach, using our authority of Luke 10, 19. Right this moment, we bind every evil of the enemy, which is coming at this time, which is coming at this video. And coming at all our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters. And we pray, we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. Father, once again, we pray that may this message reach to your appointed people, Lord, to accomplish thy mighty will, Lord. And once again, please, please do enlighten, enlighten the hearts and minds of all our dear fellow brethren through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and help them, Lord, to understand what you precisely have for them through this message during this time, Lord, and strengthen them and once again quicken your words to their hearts and lives, Lord, so that your purpose be accomplished. And once again, we thank you, Father, and we commit every single of our dear fellow brethren, we commit ourselves into thy mighty hands without any reservation whatsoever in the name, above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach, your suffering servant and our Redeemer, our Lord, our Savior, and our reigning and coming King, indeed, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. All right, you can please go ahead then. So on the eighth day of the fourth month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, tell my people not to give in to the enemy. I am coming extremely soon. There is no more time. Shalom, my beloved children. Amen. And on the ninth day of the fourth month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, tell my people to fix their eyes on me and to trust in me. There is no more time. I am coming soon. Amen. And coming to the visions which the Lord wanted us to share, the first one was on the fifth day of the fourth month of this year, 2019. And I saw a dark, basically black background. On that background, I saw a yellow menorah, and it was shining very bright. Over the menorah, I saw the words, I am the light of the world, written in blue and gray. The words were boxed with a bright yellow. And that was the end of the vision. The second one was on the third day of this month, the fifth month of this year, 2019. And I saw something which looked like a orange and blue wave. Over this, I saw some land and the sky. On the land was a cross which was shining bright. On this background, I saw the words, Jesus is coming soon, written in red, black, and brown. Below that, I saw the words, for his bride, written in pink. And below that, I saw the words, Be ye ready, written in big, bold, purple letters. And that was the end of the vision. And the third one was on the fourth day of this month, the fifth month of this year, 2019. And I saw a background of pink and purple stripes. On this background, I saw the words, Jesus Christ is coming soon, written in aqua, purple, gray, and black, and different font sizes. That was the end of the vision. So today we see that Lord Jesus Christ is reminding us that he is coming soon. And at the same time that we have a responsibility to be in his presence and not to give in to the enemy. That's the key. Today, let us understand about how we, under how we understand what we are here for. When we look around, we see so much of confusion and disagreement and strife. We cannot find any purpose or meaning in life looking here and there. It only comes through God's word. Looking here and there, we may think we know what we are here for, but pursuing that only makes us empty and it doesn't help. 
So to understand the reason we are here for, we must understand how much better God's plans are. Then we can honestly turn to his word and ask him to guide us. His word has all the answers. Have you ever asked, why am I here? What is my life for? That is a question worth considering. And the answer is, we are here to glorify God. A truly born-again believer looks to Christ for his or her every answer. Today we see in the words and visions which the Lord led us to share that as truly born-again believers, we have a responsibility not to give in to the enemy's evil schemes. Let us understand a little more about the mode of action of the enemy. Today let us take a look at what we see in Genesis chapter 3 about the attacks of the enemy. Unless we understand those attacks, that is how the enemy attacks us, we will not understand how we ought to fight them. That's the point. Genesis chapter 3, out of other places, explains to us how the enemy attacks us. It shows us how the enemy attacked and trapped Eve. So let us pay attention to it. In Genesis chapter 3, we see a progression of things which the enemy did to trap Eve. And the Bible gives us many warnings about falling into those traps. Let's take a look. Number one, Satan isolated Eve. He allured her into his craftiness. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? We see here Satan is confronting Eve. But where is Adam? Eve was separated from Adam and she was tempted by the enemy and then she gave in. The book of Proverbs gives us a warning against being isolated. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. When Peter and John followed Jesus to see what would happen after his betrayal and arrest, John, who was known to the high priest, went inside. But Peter was outside and he was alone. And then he denied Lord Jesus Christ, the very one he had said he would die for. Isolating oneself often is fatal. Number two, Satan tried to get Eve into a discussion. The latter part of Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 tells us, And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? The enemy twisted God's words so that he could get Eve into a discussion with him and then defeat her. And that's what happened. Satan started a contention between Eve and God. The book of Proverbs warns us of this also. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 14 tells us, the beginning of strife is like the releasing of water. Therefore, stop contention before a quarrel starts. Number three, Eve gave in to the enemy's trap and began conversing with Satan. Genesis chapter three, verses two and three tells us, And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Notice that whereas Eve quoted what God said, she changed his word and said that God told them not to touch the fruit, whereas he had only told them not to eat it. Eve began conversing with Satan using the wrong words. Her words would not end the contention which Satan's words started. This is in stark contrast with the words of Christ when he was tempted, which words put a strict end to the enemy's temptations. Although the enemy tried another temptation, Christ's words did not allow him to prolong that certain temptation. But when Eve started conversing, she fell in the enemy's trap. Number four, Satan contradicted God's words craftily. Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 through 5 tells us, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here, Satan used the opportunity which Eve gave him to take over. Satan took the name of the tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and said that if they eat of it, 
they will be like God, knowing good and evil. And Satan said that God said they would die because he knew they would know good and evil. But Satan said all this in a very, very cunning way. It didn't sound like he was contradicting God's word. Rather, it sounded like he was explaining what God said. Satan presented what God said in a way that presents God as trying to scare Adam and Eve so that they don't eat of the tree because they would be knowing good and evil and he didn't want that. Fifthly, number five, Eve listened to Satan's cunning words. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. So here, three things happened. Firstly, Eve looked at the tree and saw it was good for food. The fruit on the tree was not distinguished, distinguished, distinguished excuse me, from the others because its fruit appeared as bad, but because it was forbidden. Eve looked at the tree. The Hebrew word for saw in Genesis 3, 6 means to contemplate, to behold. Eve wasn't merely looking at the tree. She was thinking. She was contemplating, reflecting on what her choice should be. Maybe I'll just try it. Maybe I'll just have a bite. But slowly, it won't be just that. The second thought, when God had said no, eventually turned out a big, big mistake. That's what second thought does when we don't obey the word of God. Second, Eve saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes. Looking at the tree, the tree did not look like there was anything wrong with it. Rather, the scripture is describing it as ple pleasant to the eyes. But let us notice that it does not say pleasant to the soul. It only looked good to the eyes, but it was extremely fatal once she tasted it. The Hebrew phrase translated pleasant to the eyes is ta'ava ayin. Ta'ava means a longing and is translated pleasant. Ayin means eyes. So ta'ava means a longing. Once Satan twisted God's word, the tree looked like a very desirable thing. Once he twisted God's word, there began to build up a longing desire in Eve. This was because Eve did not stop the contention as soon as Satan tempted her. Number three, Eve saw that the tree was desirable to make one wise. The enemy said that when Eve ate of the tree, she would become like God. This was a lie. But it sounded so enticing. The Hebrew word for desirable here is chamad. And the Hebrew word for wise is sachal. Sachal means to make intelligent. Intelligence is different from wisdom. Intelligence fills one with pride. While wisdom humbles oneself. This wisdom is not wisdom but intelligence in Genesis chapter 3 verse 6. So, we understand from Genesis chapter 3 that this process of three things eventually led to the fall of all mankind. Once the enemy presented the tree to Eve with that perspective, it no longer looked like something to be avoided. What Eve did was she carefully observed the tree and it now looked good for food. It was very eye alluring and it came with an expectation to become divine. That's the trap of the enemy. Eventually, what happened? All mankind is doomed. Eve should have stopped this flattery of the enemy before she got into it. But because she did not, it led to those three things. Satan first created a doubt in Eve's mind. When Eve gave way to that by not putting an end to it there, he built up on it. He then told Eve that God was untrustworthy because he had tried to scare them by saying they would die. What Satan said sounded like he was explaining what God said, but it was cunning craftiness. Eve, enticed by all this, took a closer look at the tree. Let me re-observe it through this perspective. And that's where she was trapped. Let us review real quick the process of what happened in Genesis chapter 3, as we have seen today. Number one, Satan isolated Eve and allured her into his craftiness. Proverbs 18.1 warns us against that. 
And we also looked at the example of Peter's denial. Number two, Satan tried to get Eve into a discussion. Proverbs 7, 17, 14 warns us against that. Number three, Eve gave in to the enemy's trap and began conversing with Satan. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 14 once again warns us against that. Number four, Satan craftily contradicted God's words. In a sense, he flattered Eve. Proverbs 26, 28 warns us against that. Number five, Eve listened to Satan's cunning words. She firstly observed the tree. Proverbs 4, 15 warns us against that. Secondly, she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. Proverbs 4, 25 warns us against that. Number three, she saw it was desirable to make one wise, that is, intelligent. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 13 through 18 warns against that. So we understand that Eve was first isolated, then gave way to the enemy, and the enemy took over, and she ate the fruit. But what did all this result into? What did all this result into? Number one, this wrong decision of Adam and Eve resulted into a dread of the presence of our holy God. Before Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they had walked with the Lord in the Garden of Eden. He is holy, and they did not have any sin, which made them afraid. But now, they knew that they had sinned and were guilty, and they were thus afraid to stand in the presence of a holy God. They could no longer confidently stand with him. When God asked Adam, where are you? Adam responded, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Adam and Eve could no longer relish in the presence of God because they were not sinful. They were afraid hearing the very voice of God. That's what happens when we give in to the enemy. Second, this wrong decision and known mistake of Adam and Eve resulted in their capability to put the blame on others. Genesis chapter 3 verses 11 through 13 says, And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So here we see, firstly, that God asked Adam if he ate of the tree. God knew that Adam and Eve had eaten of the tree. So why did he then ask if he did? Because the Lord was perhaps testing Adam if he would admit what he had done. God didn't say, you ate of the tree, I told you not to eat. Now get out of the garden. God didn't say that. He gave Adam a chance to accept his mistake, but Adam did not. He blamed it on God and on Eve. What Adam was saying was, you shouldn't have given me that woman. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done this. She was the one who made me. Eat. I didn't want to, but she forced me to. If you hadn't given me her, I would not have done this. Notice that God also asked Eve. Eve also blamed it on another. She blamed it on Satan. Both of Adam and Eve's excuses sounded reasonable. It was indeed Eve who gave Adam the fruit, and it was Satan who deceived Eve. But the problem was what they intended to do. The problem was that they intended to say that they were not guilty, but were forced to do what they did. Secondly, we see here that Adam refused to accept what he did. What Adam said sounded quite reasonable. We may think that if Eve hadn't given him the fruit, he wouldn't have eaten. That may be fruit true, but there is more to it. It remains true that it was Eve who gave Adam the fruit, but at the same time, it was Adam's choice to take it. In the first part of 1 Timothy 2.14, Paul tells us that Adam was not deceived. The point is that he knowingly did what he did. It's true that it was Eve, but Adam knowingly did it. He wasn't deceived or tricked. He knew what he was doing. So while it is true that Eve was the one who gave Adam the fruit, Adam had a sin he ought to accept, which he did not. Thirdly, we see here that Eve refused to accept her mistake. Eve put the blame on Satan. 
It's true that it was Satan who deceived Eve. It's true that she was tricked. But it was Eve who did not stop the contention when it started. Satan did not just suddenly appear and start saying, You won't die if you eat of this tree. First, he made Eve give him way to deceive. If Eve had put an end to the discussion when it started, Satan would never have had an opportunity to deceive her. So that's why Eve was deceived. But the bigger problem is that she would not accept what she did. We can always find the wrong in ourselves if we are unwilling. But if we want to put the blame on others, we will always find a reason for it. However, although this fall of mankind was the result of a fatal decision, this was necessary. It was a necessary event for many valuable lessons to be hidden. Let's take a quick look at a few of those. Number one, the spiritual battle between us and the enemy is a lesson from the Garden of Eden. Verse 15 of Genesis chapter 3 tells us, it is God speaking basically, and he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Today, we cannot get into an exeget exegetical study of this, but there is so much going on. Let's just get the basic point. Eve was called the mother of all living, which means that she, as well as Adam, stand for the whole human race. For as many as have put their faith in Jesus Christ, there is a, there are, they are in a constant battle with Satan. But Christ has crushed the head of the serpent, so victory is ours. Number two, our sins cannot be covered except by the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 21 says, also, for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Even though Adam and Eve had greatly dishonored God, he still loved them. He clothed them with the skin of the animal. He didn't tell them, go make for yourselves tunics of skin. I'm not going to do it for you. No, he lovingly made it for them and clothed them with it. Unless Jesus Christ said he shed his own precious blood for our sins, we would never have been forgiven and made new. Unless he died on our behalf, we could not live. He loves us all despite our many failings and sins. He does not keep account of all the sins with which we hurt him, but he rather casts them into the depths of the sea, as we see in Micah 7.19. And through his perfect sacrifice, he has crushed the head of the serpent, and now his victory is ours too. Today is the day for each and every one of us to celebrate the victory we have in Christ Jesus because of what he did at the cross. Today let us hold on to his power and resist the devil and submit to him at all times. And before we end today, here are a few questions for us to examine ourselves. Number one, how did Satan deceive Eve? <clears throat> Number two, what was Eve's mistake in the light of 1st Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. What was Adam's mistake in the light of that scripture? Number three, what can we learn from the Garden of Eden? What have you learned? Number four, how did the Garden of Eden show us and point us to the ultimate sacrifice of Christ? Jesus Christ is coming extremely soon. Let us be in his presence, trust in him, and let us celebrate the victory we have in him because of what he did for us at the cross. And today, let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith, and finish this race strong. Thank you everybody for viewing us, and may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen, and amen, and amen. Thank you so much, Hannah, once again, for the words and visions which Messiah wanted us to share today. More importantly, the message which the Lord led you solely led by the spirit of god about the modus operandi of the enemy dear brothers and sisters that's something which we don't hear much we don't talk much about the enemy it's something like we only understand that we need to ignore the enemy or when we are having all this fleshly difficulties that's when we put on our armor and all our whatever ailments those are whatever infirmities those are and they are attacks from the enemy dear brothers and sisters please don't get us wrong but that's not the only attack enemy attacks 
There are three ways as first John, as the apostle John talks in first John chapter two, right? The flesh, the world and the devil. So we only think about all the attacks with the devil attacks us with our infirmities, inadequacies, our, our, our whatever darkness, our valleys. But there is more to it. And today we don't hear it preached much, dear brothers and sisters. The end times will be the biggest marker. As the scripture tells, dear brothers and sisters, once again, we are not here to sell our views, dear brothers and sisters. If you have been with us for a while, dear brothers and sisters, hopefully the spirit of God is talking to each one of us, talking to you that please let us be active beings in these end of the end moments. Let us receive it with an open mind what we hear and let us go back, dig deeper in the scriptures to find so if it is. Sometimes, dear brothers and sisters, we come with preconceived notions on this platform and then we don't really understand. Why? Because oftentimes we don't understand things, not because of the complexity of a topic, but because that we have the notion that we already know it. And that's not oftentimes that doesn't work out good, dear brothers and sisters. Today, the enemy somehow or the other, he traps us in the flesh. Either he makes us that we know this, we got this, we can have plan A, B, C, D, E, F. That's all right. Somehow or the other, and the flesh is the most dangerous enemy. We so many times in one single hour, if we try to analyze what we are doing through Messiah's lens. Messiah says Second Corinthians 5, 7 to walk by faith and faith alone and not by sight. If just one hour out of the 24 hours in a day, just one hour if we were to examine through Messiah's lens. Paul says, as a matter of fact, I believe that Second Corinthians 13, 5 to examine your faith. And we understand that we are told to walk by faith and not sight. So we understand that faith is not sight. And we understand from Hebrews 11, 1 that faith is 100% hope and 0% evidence. There is no error margin there. It's not like 1% evidence or 2% evidence or whatsoever. It's 100% hope, 0% evidence. There is no error margin, a period. So we understand now, Paul tells us to examine our faith in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. We understand the imperative, what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. So we understand that faith and sight are at two ends of the spectrum, which is validated by the definition of faith in Hebrews 11, which tells us that faith is 100% hope and 0% evidence. So if we were to examine on the scriptural basis, having this background, now examine our one hour out of the 24 hour in a day of our activities. What will we find, dear brothers and sisters? What will we find? Today is the day. Once again, these are things not to intimidate us, not for fear mongering. Dear brothers and sisters, one thing we have to understand very clearly, dear brothers and sisters, that God is always for us. He is not against us, but God is a holy God. His every aspect is holy. The word holy is raised to the third degree. If we go to Isaiah 6, 3, we see holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the only word in the Bible, only attribute of God, which is raised to the third degree. God's every aspect, God's love is holy love. God's righteousness is holy righteousness. God's justice is holy justice. Everything God does is holy. Once again, this holy, we tend to think about in our definition, we tend to think about that it's moral purity. Well, it might include that. But God's holiness, holiness means that what does it mean that God is holy? And we covered that in first Peter when we were in a couple couple of sessions back, I believe that holiness is that God is separate from his creation. God is separate from his creation and he calls each one of us to be holy, dear brothers and sisters. So it's so very crucial to analyze our walk every single day. Today we'll pick up on our first Peter, I believe we... Kind of we are and still the Lord has led us if you are joining us for the first time with the first Peter. If you're still listening and viewing dear brothers and sisters. Now I'm just 
once again being facetious but yes we are doing lord has led us to do the first peter the study on the expository study on the first peter so when anna and david shares the urgent words and visions with how much ever time we have we we do the first study on the first the expository study on the first peter as the lord leads us once again we hope that this encourages each one of us first peter is a staggering 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 book dear brothers and sisters for this very time it talks about sanctification dear brothers and sisters which we have zero idea at this point of time we don't understand one fact that god does not justify anybody whom he will not sanctify what does that mean that if god has justified us to the precious priceless blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth on the cross of Calvary then he will sanctify us how do we know Philippians 1 6 that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it and that's the sanctification we are talking about there so first Peter is a staggering book of sang about which talks about sanctification and other aspects of really uh, apart from book of Romans of course chapters 12 and 6 through 12 excuse me chapters 12 through 16 talks about the practical aspects of a true born again believer's life how he is supposed to live this life led by the sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit apart from that first peter talks about it so we'll pick up on first peter if the law leads you please do pray over perhaps by the time i guess we come to the end of first peter it has five chapters we come to the end of first peter our expository teaching because of the limitations of the time and the frequency which we are getting to talk about here brothers and sisters perhaps you can finish it a dozen times if not more so please do pray over dear brothers and sisters if the lord leads so we did from first peter i believe till verse 16 we did we talked about the first two verses it talks we talked about what peter is talking about sanctification then verses three through five it talks about the supernatural aspects of salvation then we saw the Purpose in verses 6 through 9 is the purpose of trials. Purpose of trials for every true born again believer. Verses 10 through 12 was about the prophesied salvation talk to the prophets. Verses 13 through 16 which we talked about the conduct of those who are saved. Hopefully today we'll pick it up around verse 17 and hopefully we'll have enough time to go through till verse 21. So verses 17 through 21 it talks about the motivation for godly living i repeat it talks about the motivation for godly living let this word once again not throw us off balance dear brothers and sisters today that is something which we don't talk about godly living the motivation for godly living that doesn't happen through us that happens through the sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit we don't talk about the person of the Holy Spirit, the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit for every single believer. We tend to think that salvation is one time thing. We now got our insurance from the hellfire and that's it. Now we'll be waiting for rapture and we will be going dear brothers and sisters. Does the scripture tell us that? What happened to Acts 17:28? In him we live and move and have our being. What happened to that? How far have we moved away from Acts 17, 28? In him we live and move and have our being. Is that just a cliche for us today as Christians? Is that just a cliche that in him we live and move and have our being and we say this and blaspheme and do whatever we feel like? We gratify our flesh. We use scriptures on top of it to just justify that. Is, is that how we are living? What happened to in him we live and move and have our being is salvation just a one-time thing is salvation like an insurance like we get from whatever like an automobile insurance we are getting from Geico is this Christ co is that what I'm being facetious once again your brothers and sisters this is not Christ co this is not because this is the precious blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He gave it all he had. All every ounce of blood was poured out. On that cross. And to give me and you. As true born again believers. We are the beneficiaries. We all are the beneficiaries. Of the love story written in, in the blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. On that wooden cross. Erected in Judea and the Mount of Calvary. Some 2000 years ago. Do we realize today. The eternal aspects. Of our redemption. Or today, 
Do we just stick with Christ Co? It's just a hellfire insurance. I have it. It's a done deal. Done did that, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, we do apologize. It's not to target anybody. It's not about these are hard things to speak about, dear brothers and sisters, but this is what the Spirit of God talks, dear brothers and sisters. Please take it to your prayer closet. Let the Spirit of God speak to you at this moment. If you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling that not in your tummy, praise God, praise God, praise God. He has not given up to room to you to Romans 1 28 to the debased mind. He is working in you. He is convicting of your sin. I cannot do that myself. Only Lord Jesus Christ can do. A fish doesn't know how much of water the fish is soaked in. So I don't know. We don't know how much of sin, how much of sin we are soaked in. Only the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God can convict us. And if he is, praise God, praise God, praise God. He is calling you today. Come to him today. Let's read the scriptures together. What Peter has today. And once again dear brothers and sisters. We also wanted to mention this. That for all our dear fellow brethren. Dear brothers and sisters. As the Lord lays on our heart. This message is once again. For the true born again believers. Dear brothers and sisters. For true born again believers. Just talking about sinner's prayer won't help. Sinner's prayer won't help you. Perhaps. Must have gone through that a while back or sometime back or whenever. A sinner's prayer doesn't help now, between now and rapture. Or now and when we expire, when, when we die, whichever comes first. What now? Isn't that a question? Hebrews 12, 1 tells us that he has set the race for us to run this race with endurance. The race which he has set the course. I don't make purposes. Romans 8 28 tells us that we know that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and who are called according to his purpose. We get so much soaked in our flesh to understand the scripture that yeah, well, well everything is working for good. But at the end, Paul is telling us that who are the called according to his purpose. Wait a minute. Paul is telling that God has a purpose for you and me. We are saved for a purpose. Noah was saved not to float in the boat. He, there was a purpose. Similar way, me and you, God has saved us. His precious through his precious priceless holy blood for a purpose. For a purpose. And what is it? God will direct our steps. May not be necessarily more than one step at a time, but God will direct our steps. Ephesians 2 10 Psalms 139 16 suppose that so this first Peter 17 through 21 it talks about the motivation for godly living hopefully we all understand that dear brothers and sisters we all agree can sign up and agree to it that as true born again believers our most important priority should be pleasing God and not using scriptures to defend our flesh Hopefully we can agree on that. If not, please do take it to your prayer closet. If the Lord leads you, please do contact us. Let's pray together. Let's pray together so that Christ is born, so that his will is accomplished through each one of us. Let's bleed the gospel of Christ. Today is the day. Today is the day to lay down doctrinal debates and bleed Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. I am a bond servant, blood bought bond servant of Lord Jesus Christ. Today is the day to proclaim if we are really, really, really understanding the redemption and the blood of precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ. Then today is the day to proclaim I am a blood bought bond servant, blood bought bond servant of Lord Jesus Christ and nobody else. He is curious, Jesus Christos. He is Kurios and I am his Doulos. And Kurios is the Greek word for Lord. Doulos is the Greek word for bondservant. Today is the day. And that's exactly what Peter is talking about. So let's pick it up. Verse 17. And we are in 1 Peter once again. Hopefully we'll have enough time once again. Dear brothers and sisters to go till verse 21 hopefully. So verse 17 Peter says. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. What's going on? Peter just wanted to use some rhyming words. 
well this is not in greek of course but in greek we don't know what it is but here it sounds like peter is telling what again to conduct yourselves and if you call on the father who without partiality judges according to each one's work conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear so the word we see the time of your stay if we as a matter of fact look into the kjv version it says so journey and if he call on the father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work pass the time of your sojourning here in fear are we sojourning dear brothers and sisters truly does my life show that does our lives demonstrate that or are we all dullers that's a question dear brothers and sisters we need to take it to our prayer closet and the privacy of our own will let the spirit of god once again at our own time let the spirit of god show us there are so many things dear brothers and sisters which once again the enemy can deceive us with and that's exactly what to the end was sharing with us about the modus operandi of the enemy if we are not anchored in the word of god truly we won't know the god of the word that's the truth are we living according to Messiah's absolute stranger uh, Messiah's excuse me Messiah's absolute standards as strangers or are we living according to the shifting dynamics of this world of our flesh and all all everything our circumstances and situations that's the key which we want to understand dear brothers and sisters once again hopefully we have been talking long enough about first peter to understand that peter is first peter is not talking about perfection he's talking about the direction perfection is not achieved in this life because the one who has started a good work has not finished it it will finish at rapture or when we die so perfection cannot be accomplished in this life but when the work has been started philippians 1 6 when the spirit of god has started a work in us then that work is in progress means what there is a direction it's not stagnant so that's the direction we are talking about that are we really being purified are our desires being aligned with the word of god as god's desires are are our habits being aligned with what the scripture tells us and that is not perfection nobody can be perfect we are not talking about sinless sinless human here nobody can be it was only lord jesus christ and nobody can be but lord jesus christ now we are blood bought bond servants of lord jesus christ and through that now we are slaves of righteousness and not slaves to sin romans chapter 6 hammers that romans chapter 6 verse 14 to be precise so dear brothers and sisters once again let's not get confused and get deceived what the enemy is telling oh well, this is all about legalism and perfection no that's not it's about the sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit it's about the work god has started in us and how he is working it out we need to understand it to yield to the spirit of god we need to understand it or else me and you will be deceived every single day we will be deceived without understanding because there are ferocious ravenous wolves satan has implanted all across the last 2000 years in the church history church has been always injured from the inside more than outside don't we see that in the history how has it changed now why will it change now revelation chapters 2 and 3 let's take a look at the report card what messiah has and how it is and we will know dear brothers and sisters the church has always been injured not from the secular world from inside that's the so highly unfortunate thing it is so peter is telling about the reverential fear dear brothers and sisters which we don't talk about these days to conduct yourself throughout the time of yours stay here in fear it's the fear the Rev the oh the reverential fear dear brothers and sisters this is not a fear about being scared or afraid it's not about the issue of salvation whether i have it in this moment next moment i will lose it this and that those are not what peter is talking about this is not even this is first peter is a book about sanctification it's talking to the beloved it's talking to one who is saved that's we who are and once again dear brothers and sisters this message first peter is solely for true born again believers and we truly believe dear brothers and sisters our fellow brethren that we are talking 
to our fellow brethren who have been saved, who are saved by the precious, priceless, holy blood of Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the blood which was shed on Calvary on that wooden cross. But the question is, what do we do now? Now and here, what do we do now till the day of rapture or till the day of the I die, which comes first? What do we? That's what Peter, first Peter is addressing once again. Let's not get confused. Rightly dividing the word is the key. Second Timothy 2 15, dear brothers and sisters, enemy will cause tremendous amount, 500 percent, if possible, amount of confusion. So let us not get confused. This fear, Peter is talking about the awe of God, dear brothers and sisters, each one of us. Each one of us are heading towards the final exam after rapture. 2 Corinthians 5.10 tells us that's the Bema Seed judgment. We need to understand that, that each one of us are heading towards our final judgment. We talk, it about, talk that about as rewards. Well, nobody is losing the salvation. No, nobody is losing the salvation. We are losing our rewards. Now we have no idea, dear brothers and sisters, on this side of the chasm, what those rewards are, how they are all going to play out, why is it crucial for every, each and every believer. Messiah said that occupy till I come to Paul says to persevere. Why are those things said Paul himself? Seems like so paranoid. He's always running and running. He's uh, he's perhaps it sounds like that he's an athlete or um, once again being facetious. But yes, Paul is always he is so very concerned about his rewards. Why are we not? Because we don't understand today. Because the heresies have propagated and impenetrated the body of Messiah, the bride of Messiah, so much that now we think that uh, those are just. Accessory things which we don't even have to care about. But the reverential fear is once again the crucial key what Peter is talking about. Which is evidence once again by a tender conscience of watchfulness against temptation. A watchfulness against temptation. Are we every single day watching against temptation? And avoiding things that would displease God. That's the key to understand dear brothers and sisters. And then Peter continues. In verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So there is so much going on. Why are we supposed to conduct while we are here? Peter says there were five imperatives. First we saw in verses 13 through 16. There were five imperatives, right? To guard up the loins of our loins of our mind to rest our hope fully upon the future grace which is to be brought to us at the revelation of Lord Jesus Christ to be obedient children not conforming ourselves to the formulas as in our ignorance and then to be holy for he is holy and then Peter says that to conduct ourselves our stay throughout the time of our stay here in that reverential fear why not because of legalism, not because of our works, not because trying to compete and trying to make it to heaven every single day. Once again, to make it on our strength, dear brothers and sisters, from the day we were born, even as a matter of fact, we are disqualified because we were brought forth in iniquity. So we are disqualified there itself. But if we are deceived thinking that our good works can do that every single day, 24 seven, for how many years, 60, 70, 80 years we live every day, no thing in every action of ours, every deed, every thought, everything of us, they shouldn't be any, they should be perfection. And then finally, that person who thinks that he will, then he will be perhaps going to heaven and suddenly telling God, move over. Now there are two of us. <laughs> Once again, I'm being facetious, dear brothers and sisters. But hopefully with the clumsy example, we can put the point across, dear brothers and sisters, that works, this is works, take us nowhere. 
this works based all the debates whatever is going on is a distraction put in our path it's time to rise up for such a time as this God has shed his precious blood for you and me for such a time as this we need to lift up our holy hands and proclaim Lord Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and I will live for him and him alone no matter what it takes no matter no matter what it takes no matter what the separation is no matter what the cost is I will live for him and him alone even at the cost very cost of my life till my last breath I will proclaim Christ is King Lord Jesus Christ is King the zeal to pursue Lord Jesus Christ the zeal to bleed the gospel of Christ not to give into distractions and debates and things alike we are not here to listen to preachers and pulpits and social media teachers sitting and clapping Wow Wow, we are not here to do that. We are here to bleed Christ together. And that's not through a power of might or strength. It's through the Spirit of God. Through the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That's what Peter is telling us. That knowing that we were not redeemed by all the different kind of things. With what is Peter telling? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained. Messiah's death on the cross was not a knee-jerk reaction in the Garden of Eden. It was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God has foreordained that he will die for you and me. Today has some our salvation my salvation has it just boiled down to a few scriptures few bible verses what happened to in him we live and move and have our being where are we today what happened to us is satan going to deceive us in these end moments no he cannot because greater is he who is in us first john 4 4 then he who is trying to deceive us then he who is in the in this world second Corinthians 12 9 his grace is sufficient his grace is sufficient to live for Christ is the day the time an hour to stand up to live for Christ to be obedient first Peter chapter 1 so far we read dear brothers and sisters we see obedience obedience is the theme of first Peter obedience is not legalism Obedience is a proof of saving faith. That's what First Peter tells us. Obedience to God demonstrates our love for him. First John 5, 2, 3. What does it say? By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God. That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Obedience to God demonstrates our faithfulness to him. First John chapter two, two, excuse me. First John chapter two, verses three through six. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. That's a test of knowing that we are in him. He who says he abides in him, verse 6, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. These are hard scriptures. If it's binding you today, praise God. Please, dear brothers and sisters, please, our dear fellow brethren, get on your knees. He has a plan for you. He is calling you. Please repent of your sins. He has a plan to make your life glorious beyond imagination. Today is the day to take that leap of faith. Today is the day. He is alive. His power is alive in our lives every day. Obedience to God glorifies him in the world. 1 Peter 2.12 Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And we know that faith is necessary to please God. Hebrews 11.6 tells us that. But without faith it is impossible to please him. 
And if our faith is genuine and true, we will live a lifestyle characterized by righteousness, which is the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, modeling our life, modeling the example set for us by Lord Jesus Christ himself. First John 2, 6 tells us what? He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. He who says he abides in Lord Jesus Christ ought himself also to walk just as Lord Jesus Christ walked. Your brothers and sisters, we obey his commands not because we have to, but because we want to, because we love him. We are, enab we are enabled to obey. That's not our flesh or all legalism, all those things. There is nothing good in this rotten flesh. What is good of the best is filthy rags. There is nothing good in me or in this flesh. We are enabled to obey Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because once we believe Lord Jesus Christ and we are saved, we are remade. We are not the same people we once were. Second Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says what? If anyone is in Christ, he is, not he will be. He is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. We can play around with these scriptures or surrender to God and he will activate it in our lives with perfection in his perfect time, dear brothers and sisters. We are not sharing just head knowledge. We are sharing experientially. We are talking, dear brothers and sisters, with the mercy and grace and love beyond imagination, which Lord Jesus Christ has showered on a felt like me and my family, dear brothers and sisters. He is glorious. He is beautiful. Come to him. There is nothing worth pursuing. Today is the day. Drop everything. Come to him. Life will be glorious. Not the glorious of what we think in flesh, but beyond any human definition, it will be glorious. We are a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It is the work of the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Salvation is just not about justification. It's just not about having few, it boiling it down to few scriptures for Pulling up a wall, a pro opposition, and just, it's not a, a punching bag. We just have you hang a punching bag and start using those verses against legalism and doing it. Salvation is a supernatural phenomenon. Once we come to Lord Jesus Christ in Him, we live and move and have our being. Truly and honestly. The present ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in a true born again believer's life is indeed, indeed phenomenal. And I'm sure our dear fellow brethren, so many of you right this moment can say amen to that. Amen to that. That the present ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in a true born again believer's life is phenomenal. Which perhaps unfortunately is not talked about much in these end moments. When we obey the Lord, dear brothers and sisters, which is to yield to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can live a life of joy without shame, rooted deeply in the Lord and confident in our eternal hope. What does Paul say? 2 Corinthians 3, 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. We don't have to run from channel to channel or for social media teachers. We don't have to flock in churches and modern pulpits. To understand that we are, if the Son has set you and me free, we are free indeed. The Word of God is enough. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise God, praise God, praise God. His Word is enough. His blood is sufficient for me, for each one of us to be a blood-bought bond servant. Our obedience, dear brothers and sisters, is actually part of our assurance that we truly know God. First John 2, 3. What does Apostle John tell us? Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Let the Satan not use this verse as a distraction point. Because you are imperfect, because I am imperfect. Nobody is perfect, but we will go today 
to the cross of Calvary. Today we will spend time. Today we will mourn over our sin. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted by Christ and Christ himself. And that comforting dear brothers and sisters. My words know there are no words in this earth which can describe the comfort of Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sure once again you can say amen. Uh, dear fellow brethren, if you have experienced that, I'm sure you did. When we as true born again believers are being obedient to our Heavenly Father, no matter what the cost is, our Heavenly Father is glorified. Messiah told us in Matthew 5, 16, in the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So basically, Messiah, in essence, is telling that the plan is for others to see our good deeds, which is the good deeds which we are not doing. We don't plan good deeds and do is the good works. Ephesians 2.10, which is already preordained for you and me. Our schedule is already doodled there. Everything is there. We just need to go and ask him. And he will tell us step by step. He will. So Messiah here is telling us that the plan is for others to see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven, Matthew 5, 16. And of course, once again, performing good deeds, which is by yielding to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, requires obedience. Obedience to the one who calls us to good deeds. A Christian's testimony of holiness is a strong witness that God is at work in the world. I repeat... Today, your and my testimony, every Christian's testimony, every true born again believer's testimony of holiness is a strong witness that my God, our God is at work in the world. All the pagan gods, all the heathen gods and all satanic forces cannot light will shine through every darkness and the darkness will not comprehend it. Psalm 128 one says, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walks in his ways. The Bible often tells us, dear brothers and sisters, that God blesses and rewards obedience. James 1, 22 through 25, real quick, let's take a look what it says. What does James say? But be, be doers of the word. Oh, I have to do its legalism. No, it is not. It is the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It is the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, John 16, Messiah says, we'll send you another helper. That helper is not sent for us so that we can just do anything we want. The Holy Spirit is there to convict us and do the perform the good work which has been started in every true born again believer. Philippians 1, 6. So, but be doers of the word. And once again, because of the time constraint, you're trying to rush dear brothers and sisters. So James says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. Psalm 119 verses 1 through 2 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. There are so many scriptural blessings pronounced. Why don't we seek them? That's just yielding to the Spirit of God. The work of the indwelling Holy Spirit from today till the day of rapture. But unfortunately the heresies and deception which has been indoctrinating the Christians. That makes obedience. That tells obedience is a mere optional thing in the school of Messiah. Whereas the Bible teaches us that obedience is the core elective course in the school of Messiah. In the school of faith. And is the very heart of Christianity. Today to live a life governed by car carnality. Our fleshly desires. We have started redefining biblical truths. Nullifying the work of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And then we start wondering. Why is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. All these things are diminishing. 
Today, unfortunately, dear brothers and sisters, many professing Christians have started walking on a compromised path. Psalm 119 verses 1 and 2 says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him in with the whole heart. Here the blessed, the word blessed describes people of righteousness, God's own people, his bride. Those who are totally subservient to God's will and wholeheartedly devoted in their relationship to him. We do not compromise or deviate from his standards, but walk only in his path. And that is indeed the work of the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Nothing to do with legalism. We hear only God's voice and his inherent word, not opinions, not conjectures, not doctrinal de debates. First, what does Eli Elijah say in 1 Kings 18.21? He says, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. What did the people do? But the people answered him, Not a word. John 8.47, staggering confrontation between Messiah and the Pharisees. What John 8.47 John records, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. John 10, 27, Messiah says what? My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Dear brothers and sisters, if we understand the Good Shepherd discourse, we will understand one thing that others we don't yield, others we don't obey, others we don't follow, if we truly follow Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because Messiah says, John chapter 10 verses 4 and 5, And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger. But will flee from him. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Today is the day to flee. To flee and flee from our flesh. From the strangers. From everything. To Lord Jesus Christ. And we do not yield to any indoctrination to his word. Psalm 119 verse 128. Psalmist says. Therefore all your precepts concerning all things. I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Yeah, brothers and sisters, not compromising requires our absolute, unswerving submission to him and to him al alone, regardless of the world's as well as our surroundings, concession to the godlessness, or even to run away from the form of godliness, the religiosity and those deception. We need to be absolutely committed to God's word. Joshua 24, 15 says, And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side, that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Psalm 119 verse 10 says, With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Once again, that's the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit we see. Psalm 119 verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Are we today? As true born again believers, dear brothers and sisters, we must see to it that no one takes us captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that Colossians 2.8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. Hebrews 3.12, as a matter of fact, also indicates that Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Today we have those who profess to be being Christians, yet live lives not according to the word of God. Compromising their biblical beliefs so highly and fortunate. By living like the world, but having a form of godliness. For them, the things of the world and its 
all the glitters of this world, the, the sensual allurements take precedence over the word of God. Acts 20 verse 30 says, also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. 1 John 2, 15 through 19 tells us the same thing. Messiah, as a matter of fact, referred to these people as those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Fruit bearing brings glory to our Heavenly Father, John 15, 8. But the question is, once again, these are the ones, dear brothers and sisters, though professing to follow Christ, compromise their faith by craving worldly success and accolades from their fellow men. Messiah chastised such people who rationalize their questionable behavior. Messiah records, Messiah said, how can you believe in John chapter 5? How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from only God? In other words, to compromise, dear brothers and sisters, in one's total allegiance and devotion to God is to allow the glitters of this world, the allurements of this world, with its accompanying worries to take precedence over Christ. The question is, once again, how do we compromise the word of God when we fail to accept the word? 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. How do we compromise the word of God when we place our desires and that of others ahead of the word of God? Acts 5, 4 tells us, While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. How do we compromise the word of God? As true believers in Christ, we must accept God's word as absolute inerrant truth. That said, we don't play with it. We don't look here and there trying to fit it to our knees. Those are not custom made. Those are not tailored for what I want for my fleshly needs. Those are absolute things. The word of God does not mend and change according to me. I change according to the word of God. That's the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Dear brothers and sisters, we must be fully obedient to his word. In these end moments, that's the key. Messiah says, John 14 verse 15. What does he say? If you love me, keep my commandments. First John 5 3. Apostle John records, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Apostle John records in the second epistle, 2 John 1, 6, this is love. We talk about love. What is love? It is defined now. This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. Today, we don't see love. We talk about people are filled with hatred. What is that hatred? That they are not walking according to his commandments. Bible defines this is love. That we walk according to his commandments. Dear brothers and sisters, every second, every femtosecond, every plank length of time second, the lowest second possible. We must recognize that God's word is not to be compromised for any reason or anyone. Today is the day, dear brothers and sisters, we need a formal commitment to the word of God to galvanize our walk with Messiah. In these last moments, in this world, the longer we live, dear brothers and sisters, we tend to be so very committed to so many different things. Our family, our, our, our job, our social commitments, our friends, our perhaps religious commitments at times and Dear brothers and sisters, in of itself, these are not wrong things. These are not wrong things to do. But when we don't know how to prioritize them according to the scriptures, we get into satanic trap as we start. Why? Because we then start acting against the word of God and start justifying our actions. That's a bad place to be. The Bible teaches 
The Bible teaches that the chief commitment of our lives is to God himself, to Messiah, to Lord Jesus Christ himself. Messiah said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind. Matthew 22, 37, Luke 10, 27, Mark 12, 30, all emphasizes that. Messiah is basically telling you and me once again that with every fiber, every fiber of our being, every facet of our lives must be committed to loving and serving God. This means that we must not hold anything back from Lord Jesus Christ because God did not. On Calvary, he shed every ounce of his blood for God's soul of the world. That he gave his only begotten son to butchery for you and me. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. But will have an everlasting life. Furthermore Messiah tells us that. Our commitment to Messiah must. 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 Supersede our commitment to even our families. Messiah records Luke 14 verses 26 and 27. These are inerrant words. These are not stories. These are not fables. These are Messiah only says what he means and he always means what he says. We need to learn that principle once again to be governed and to walk in spirit every single day in the days that remain. So Messiah says what? Luke 14 verses 26 to 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot, he cannot, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot. There are two cannots. We need to pay heed to dear brothers and sisters. Bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Luke 14, 26, 27. Such commitment, dear brothers and sisters, means our family relationships may be cut off. May be severed. It means our commitment to Christ demands if given an either or situation. We turn away from them and continue on with Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Christ is telling. Do we understand that Messiah's word? Let's read the red words. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me, he is not, he is not, not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me, he is not, he is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not, is not worthy of me. Three knots. And Messiah ends with he who finds his life will lose it. And who, he who loses his life for my sake will find it. The bottom line, dear brothers and sisters, is that once again, that those who cannot make that kind of commitment cannot be his disciples. That is what Lord Jesus Christ is telling. And this is not about doing anything in flesh. This is once again, let's not lose our perspective. First Peter is about the sanctification ministry. What can the Holy Spirit, indwelling Holy Spirit accomplish through you and me when we yield to the Spirit of God? We are not doing anything. We are bearing fruit. We don't produce fruit. We bear John chapter 15, abiding in him, bears, makes us bear much fruit. Without him, we can do nothing. When we abide in him, we bear, we don't produce. So it's not our effort. We just yield and this is what the Spirit of God, the indwelling Holy Spirit can accomplish, dear brothers and sisters. This is what Lord Jesus Christ is telling, bottom line, that who cannot make this kind of commitment cannot be his disciple. This is Messiah telling. Are we going to comply? Or are we going to bypass it with other scriptures? Or are we going to argue over it? Or are we going to deny it? Messiah is warning us in advance, dear brothers and sisters. The reason for such commitment and loyalty is that the trials we may have to endure will be quite demanding. Our allegiance to him at times may be arduous. John 15, 18 tells us if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Messiah alerted his disciples, John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. 
If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. The Apostle Paul echoed his warning in 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 2 Timothy 3.12. Messiah has made it plain, dear brothers and sisters, the cost of discipleship, Luke 9, 23 and 24. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. In essence, once again, dear brothers and sisters, Messiah is telling the true cost of commitment to Christ is one's Total self-denial, daily cross-bearing, and the continual following of him. And we are almost done. Please do bear with us, dear brothers and sisters. We apologize once again. We're going over time. We try to keep it within one and a half hours. But please do bear with me. We are almost done. These imperatives, once again, these imperatives picture for us, dear brothers and sisters, sacrifice, self selflessness and service and that is exactly the work of the sanctification ministry of the indwelling holy spirit because when we deny our flesh we walk in spirit that's what it is when messiah is telling to deny our flesh we are not doing any other fleshly activity we either are slaves of righteousness or slaves of sin we either walk we either walk in flesh or we walk in the spirit it's always either or dear brothers and sisters it's always either or there is no mid ground there is no here and there things. Either we are off him or against him. And that the scripture should tell us, our walk should tell us. A cross epitomized ultimate punishment and humiliation. Galatians 3.13 from Torah Paul took and said what? Cursed is he who hanged on that tree. More than that, dear brothers and sisters, it fully demonstrated the love of God. Romans 5.8, he demonstrated how while we were sinners, while we were healed, his enemies, he died for us. Selfless and sacrificial in the giving of his life for the world. Matthew 20, 28 tells us that just as the son of man did not come to be served, but serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul followed Lord's example of commitment and sacrifice and service. Paul said, I have been Galatians 2, 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life. Life I now live in the flesh I live, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The question is today, where do we stand with Galatians 2.20? Today are we bleeding the gospel of Christ? Total commitment to God, dear brothers and sisters, means that Lord Jesus Christ is our sole authority, our guiding light, our unerring compass. Being committed to Christ means being fruitful. It means being his bond servant, blood bought bond servant. For me to live as what? To live as Christ, then we need to prove it today. Does our life show it? Is he truly my Lord? Am I truly obedient as his word commands me to? Am I truly obedient to his word and to the spirit of God, yielding to the spirit of God? Do I have and just do I have just like a form of godliness or do I like at all times to be filled with his goodness and lost in his love, the holy love of God? Does my life, does my life demonstrate it? Stay here. Does my life demonstrate that we are staying here in reverential fear? Does my life, we talk so much about gospel. We must talk so much about gospel. We give into debates and every what not. Have we considered Philippians 120, 127, excuse me, Philippians 127, conduct worthy of gospel, our conduct worthy of gospel, Philippians 127, we are running out of time, please do look up dear brothers and sisters, Philippians 127, do we, have we paid heed to Philippians 1.5, fellowship, fellowship in the gospel, have we paid heed to 1 Corinthians 9.14, living from the gospel according to the word of God. Messiah, as a matter of fact, it says Messiah commands us, those who talk about, those who talk about the gospel to live according to the word of God, according to the gospel. Have we paid heed to that? Today is the day, dear brothers and sisters. This is not fear mongering. This is nothing we have to do. Today is the day 
to once again have that powerful resource which is greater as he who is in us that powerful resource the spirit of God can be and will be activated as we surrender to him completely as we repent of our sins completely as we ask him Lord now here I am lead me and guide me if grace be so much if this is your love then here I am Lord use me Whatever it takes, use me. Today is the day to repent of all our sins, to recommit our lives to Christ and make a formal commitment to Lord Jesus Christ to surrender our all to Him and Him alone so that He can make our lives glorious beyond human comprehension so that these mouth, these mouth can be used to praise Him and honor Him and glorify Him 24-7, 365 till the day of rapture or till we die, whichever comes first. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters, once again, for viewing us, for being a part of our spiritual family. Dear brothers and sisters, once again, let us be on fire for Lord Jesus Christ, not through power or might, but through His Spirit. Let us keep yielding to the Spirit of God. Let us be the light of the world, being Messiah's reflected glory. Let us be the salt of the earth. Let us once again do what Messiah wants us to do, not what we want, but what Messiah wants. Let His will be accomplished, no matter what the cause be. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah's return is imminent. And today, let us end with a short word of prayer. Shall we, Anna? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again, I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us that you are coming extremely soon, Lord. And bless us as we go forth from here and fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And help us, Lord, to glorify you in every single thing we do, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you once again, dear brothers and sisters, for viewing us. Messiah's return is upon us. Let us keep up the faith. Let us fight the good fight in his might. And let us finish this race strong by yielding to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. God bless each and every one of you. Shalom.